All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our study on Wednesday, our sewing. Um, Kenny uh, mentioned the scripture and everything earlier that we should study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so we come to that portion where we're just going to open up the word of God and study his word and see what he is telling us. And um, and and in that we we as we study we grow we learn and um, we see God in uh, new ways you know um, God doesn't change but our understanding of God changes because even as we read scriptures whether we read it one time or a hundred times God still has a way of speaking to us and showing us and enlightening us and revealing unto us something that is within there that speaks to our very situations. And so we come this evening. Um, tonight, we're gonna start um, a new series. Um, this is based upon a book that is called, I, I Could, I Might, I Can, I Should, I Will. And so each week we're going to take one of the chapters from, these, from this book and dive into it to um, talk about it and discuss it. If you're interested in purchasing the book, you can find it on Amazon. It's all of $6.49 and you will have it the next day. And you can see it's a very thin book. So it's not a whole lot of um, reading and big words and things like that, but a very simple study to do a little bit of self-reflection as we also look in the word of God to see what, what does God say about this? And so tonight, um, my assignment is just to go through the introduction because many of us don't have the book as of yet. And we really want you all to uh, get the book and to follow along and to be a part of the study and the discussion as we move forward um, in this series. So let me just stop right there. We're just going to bow for a word of prayer. I think um, those that are joining us um, on the Zoom link are here. Uh, we do invite others if you're to please come on to Zoom. That way you can ask your question live, you know, and be a part of the discussion. Um, let, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this moment in time, God, where, Lord, we can just study and to um, seek your word, God, and to understand even the moral, God, to sharpen uh, ourselves, Lord, for you said in your word that iron sharpens iron, Lord. I pray, the Lord, that it's uh, this time, Lord, would be a time of you, Lord, speaking unto us, Lord, and giving us um, understanding. So I pray, Lord, that you would hide me, oh God, that they don't see or hear me, but they see and hear you, God. And even even now, Lord, just prepare us, oh God, to receive what it is that you're saying through these passages. We thank you for those that have joined us, Lord, and those that are on the way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So in, in this book, um, in the intro, they, they, it, it talks about a story of this young, young lady. Her name is Heather. And Heather um, had been, had, had, well, at the beginning of the story, Heather was just married, right? And so she decided to join her husband's church. And in so doing, you know, she was on fire for the Lord. You know, she was ready to do um, whatever needed to be done. They were a young couple raising kids. The kids were um, raised inside of the church. Um, and when she, when she came and everything, she came with an expectation um, to make a difference in the church. You know, she wanted her kids to be a part of the church. She wanted to be a part of um, the different ministries and the programming um, and whatever was going on in the church. You know, it excited her. She wanted to give and she wanted to serve um, with, and, and she did, and she did it with joy. And so I want to pause for a moment because I want to ask this question. Um, when you first came to the Lord, how did you feel? You know, when you first joined the church, you know, what did you feel? 
Um, some of us, I know, I'm looking at those that are on the Zoom and everything. You know, we have been in church for quite a long time. Titty, I see you there. You know, as kids, we came, you know, to church and were a part of the church, you know. But as we, as we grew up in the church, right, you know, and have become adults and really understood, you know, our calling, you know, whether it be, you know, teaching or preaching or, you know, even our talents of singing in the choir and things like that and giving and serving. How did we feel when we first, you know, understood that and started to walk in that? And I'm going to pause for a moment. I'm curious to hear you. Not Anybody? to make too much mm -hmm. silence, I will just say for, for myself, I can recall um, when I, I became an adult and I met with my wife and the first place she brought me was to church, you know? So we came and um, there were some questions that I had for God. There were a lot of questions that I had amassed being in college and apart from the church for those those four years. Um, and he, he did something miraculous for me that made, that took all the pause away. And that was to answer those questions by a minister that I didn't know. He just came forward and it was like he read, he read the list. And from that point, not only was I eager, I was excited because I just truly believed that the Lord was speaking directly to me. He just was calling me, used this, this particular ministry to to be his instrument, to do that, and the use of the Holy Spirit. And it was just, it was actually for me, it, it was, the, there was quite a bit of excitement for me because now I wanted to know more, mm -hmm. you know, and I really began to really read my word, to study God's word, to understand it. And I believed that I knew him in a different way than I had known before. Before I call it a matter of fact kind of relationship where you're told like, okay, this is, you know, God is, God is all powerful and all these kinds of things, you know, and I, and I understood that and I accepted that even as a young age, you know, God is creator of all things. Jesus is our Lord and savior. He died for my sins, but, um, it was something else that I had been missing for such a long time. And I've, I felt like now my relationship with God was really beginning to grow. And, um, and I just, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get enough. I couldn't get yeah. enough. I just had to know more. It, it sounds like there was a hunger and there was a thirst and a, a yearning to not only know God, even the more, but also to serve God, right? That's that that's what I'm hearing. And so, you know, many of us, yeah, we we definitely can relate to um Reverend Reggie, your 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 sentiments there of that that uh, um when when we came to Christ or when we came to a knowledge, you know, of um in a relationship with the Lord um in that capacity. I want to go on with um with Heather's story because it shifts, you know? So as she's writing this years later, she realizes, and she can't put her, her finger on it when things started to change, you know? She, she and, and she talks about, you know, um, I, didn't, I didn't see the change that had happened in me, but I do now as I look back, realized that there was a change. And so she calls out one particular time in which, you know, um, she realized that some things were different. And she talks about how she was invited to be um, the tr uh, assistant um, trustee or something in that capacity where um, she now had to attend a church meeting. 
And in, in all of her years that she had been there, in all of her time that she had been there, she had not yet gone to a church meeting. And so now she was being invited into this church meeting. And so she went in there, you know, with, a, <clears throat> with an openness, you know, when trying to understand what's going on and everything. And uh, they're going through the meeting and um, she's noticing, you know, how, how things are going, that it, it seems there's a heaviness in, in the room. And so the pastor, um, a after a while, had made a suggestion, you know, to change the time of worship from 11 o'clock in the morning to 1030 in the morning. <clears throat> and he gave his reasons. He said, you know, um, in his understanding of, of the community and everything around them, there's a lot of young people here who'd rather come to church a little bit earlier. There are a lot of young families that, ra um, that rather come to church a little bit earlier. And so to attract these people um, to the church, it would make sense for us to consider changing the hour from 11 o'clock to 10.30. So I guess you can all already guess what took place in that meeting, right? Mm -hmm. It was a problem and it was a big problem. And there was a controversy and a couple of the, the um, seasoned saints that were there raised their voices and, you know, you can kind of, I, 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 you probably already know what they said. This is how we've always done it. Why are we changing things for people we don't even know and members and, and, and for people that aren't even members yet, right? Um, what about us? This is our church. What about our needs? Don't we come first? Mm -hmm. And And so, you know, it was that attitude that, you know, was was present in everything in that room. And I'm curious, what did this um, teach Heather about the church? As she's at this meeting and, you know, her understanding even before that, you know, was all about giving and serving and and all of that, and now she attends this meeting and she's hearing of hearing all of this other stuff. What do you think that did to her? Do you think I, that she got I think I think it discouraged her because what what I'm hearing, I didn't read the book, but what I'm hearing from you explaining it is that the church was not willing to change for others. And that mm -hmm. and if and and if they're teaching love. That's what love is. So we, you know, in giving love, I'm going to deny myself for, for the happiness of somebody else. That doesn't mean that I am going to make myself really small for, for somebody else. But if it's going to help them out, and if I got to get up 15 minutes early, I'm going to do that. Back to the question that you that you asked about coming through the church. And I remember when I first came to Antioch and, and, and Reverend Austin gave me a key to the church. I thought I was a big shot. I had a key to the church. I used to get up early in the morning. I want to get to the church and open up the church. I want to be the first one there. Had to rush to be the to, uh, to beat Miss Pettiford to get to the church. And I I had a key. I was the man. I had a key to the church. And I go turn the air conditioner on, turn the lights on. And I was just so happy to do that because I felt like I was doing it. And anything I did around the church, whether it was plowing the snow, picking up something. I remember Mr. Walker, I was when I first came to the church, uh, there was a can of something in front of the church. I walked right by it. And he called me, he said, young man, young man. And he said, he said, what's that? And he pointed to it. I said, oh, it's a can or a cup or something like that. And he said, yeah, you, and it's in front of your church. He said, never walk past nothing that's in front of your church that shouldn't be there. And every time I, I see something, a piece of paper or something, I always think about that that more. Man, I was excited to pick that can up. You know, or because people used to sit on a little wall or whatever and leave their garbage behind. Just so he taught me to make to have pride in the church. So mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. But yeah, some of the things in which she learned about the church was that it was insular, that it only cared about those that were, you know, um in the church, those that um about getting their needs met instead of trying to help the needs of others where they really didn't want any outsiders to be a part of the church. Deacon and so Leon it also wasn't, had his hand mm -hmm. up. Deacon Leon had his hand up as well. Oh, Deacon Leon? 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, you know, as you were talking about the church and this specific situation, I remember we had a a, a, a similar situation um, in some ways um, back in Jamaica. And it was as a result of um, uh, they wanted to uh, change the deacon, the, the, the deacon board. They want to change the pastor's council members because they wanted to vote. And this was um, uh, the first vote in decades <laughs> that was taking place. And, and so persons, it caused a big issue because persons was, you know, thought that I, I, this shouldn't be voted on, you know, I, I, this is my seat, you know, I, I am, <laughs> I'm supposed to be on this board, you know, or, or did you come and want to vote and you want to change? So, so, so oftentimes in churches, we uh, get positions and we have positions and if you are, you have it for years and you, we, we forget about that relationship with Christ and recognize that it is not about the position, but it's about Christ. And so when if a change comes about, that becomes a whole uproar in the church. Um, it could even split churches sometimes. So, um, you know, that just brought back that situation to my mind. Yeah, yeah. And in this situation, you know, Heather's Church was a religious country club. That's what it had become. And over time, guess what? Heather had become a member with the same type of an attitude where her attitude as to when she came in of giving and serving was now all about um, being served over the course of time. And that pastor that raised that suggestion, well, his tenure wasn't that long. He um, ended up leaving the church and then another pastor came in and guess what? He ended up leaving the church as well um, because of the spiritual sickness that had taken root in that church. And so we want to talk about this a little bit because we don't want, you know, I'm, I'm using this as uh, using Heather's church as an example, but sometimes we too fall into some of those situations, whether it's individual or collective, where we can use a little bit of self-reflection as to um, the type of behaviors and the type of attitudes that we have or that is, that is being conveyed um, to others or how others may see us. All right, so let's take a look at the scriptures. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter two, um, and we're gonna be going through verses one through 11. On your screen right now, you see verses one through five, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And it says, <clears throat> if there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not at your own interests, but in the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And here we see that Paul is talking, to, talking about Christian conduct. And more specifically, he's talking about the attitude of the believer. And so he's encouraging the church to take on or to share the same behavior and the same attitude that Christ demonstrated in his earthly ministry. And so to use Christ as our example of how we should be walking and talking, it's, you know, it, it, it sets the bar pretty high. You know, when many times we see ourselves and we like, oh, we're good people. You know, we do this and we do that. But when we, when we look at ourselves, 
and then compare it to Christ, there are some things that we may not be doing as best as we ought to be doing or can be doing. Um, and as we take, um, as we take, as we uh, take part in this type of um, behavioral change, you know, this metamorphosis of ourselves to be more and more like Christ, the result of it is oneness. We become, we all become one, one in Christ Jesus, one in the body of Christ, and and in that we then become be able we're then able to experience joy and it's not just joy but it is as the word says complete joy all right so now to truly understand this text we have to kind of go back to the beginning of philippians and what we'll find there is that paul is in prison he um is in rome and he's not sure um what his fate is going to be you know, he is he he may be in prison for the rest of his life. He may even um, ultimately be put to death. And so Epaphrodites, who is probably the pastor of the Philippian church, came to visit Paul. And when he visited Paul, he brought him some money to um to help make his prison stay a little bit more comfortable. Today we would say that. Uh, Epaphrodites put, put um, money on Paul's books. And so Paul was appreciative of this kindness that was displayed. And this wasn't the first time that the Church of Philippi had ministered to Paul's needs. And so this letter is not only a thank you letter, but a letter of encouragement um, that uh, to them and, and a letter of correction in Christian conduct. And so Paul in this letter to the church of Philippi is addressing, you know, here some of the concerns um, of things that had started to creep into the church. Um, there was rivalry that was happening. And then there was personal ambition um, that was present among the saints. And so Paul wanted not just to address it, but to correct it with practical applications. Paul, he throws out this rhetorical statement in verse one, and he says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, and we all know what a rhetorical statement or a rhetorical question is. It's usually one in which we already know what the answer is, and also we also understand it to be um, understanding that the person in which we're directing that question or that statement to, they too know what the answer is. It's, it's similar to like asking your kids and, and knowing that their room isn't clean and asking them, hey, is your room cleaned up? Or when you walk in the front door and you know um, you see your spouse and you don't smell anything cooking and everything, you ask, hey, what are you cooking? You know, doggone well, ain't nothing on that kitchen stove. So why are you asking the question? You know, but it's those kind of rhetorical questions. This is what Paul was doing in this statement. So we can kind of switch out the word for if to since or therefore, because it was something that they already knew. So if we put that in there and say, since we know that Christ did encourage, and we know this because we saw it. We saw how he encouraged the disciples, you know, um, he told them to baptize, to teach, to do ministry, to be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all across to the ends of the earth. We know this. And since there is comfort in loving one another um, the way that Christ had loved us, you know, we share the fruit of the spirit. We have gifts. We're given, um, you know, uh, uh, um, all of those, those gifts because the spirit of God lives in us. So have we have compassion? It's in us, but do we show it? We ought to be doing it, and so we're, 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 we should be sympathizing with others. And when we do this, guess what? It makes our joy complete. How many of us, from time to time, we need that encouragement? You know, how does it make you feel when somebody encourages? Hey, you did a great job. Hey, you know, you um, keep doing what you're doing. It, whatever it is, you know. How many of us, you know, we, 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 we need to feel love. 
And not just any type of love, but that agape love, that love that is without conditions or pretense, that that patient and that kind love and that forgiving love and that steadfast love, right? How many of us have um, who've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, have the spirit of God in us? You know, where it, it it dwells and it, it it manifests itself in us. You know, um, we all have that. We have it because the Bible tells us that we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit till the day of redemption. Right? How many of us need to feel mercy from time to time? You know, to to um, have somebody to show compassion. I, last Friday, I was going through. Um, Good Friday. I had experienced a week of everything. I was in the emergency room twice, once with my dad, not getting out until after midnight, once with down, I had to run down to South Jersey to help my daughter because she was having an experience and was going through um, ER and I had to help out there. And then, you know, I was preparing for Friday night because I wanted to be a part of the Good Friday service. I had made a promise that I would would take part and as we're getting in the car on our way to, to, to the church, I get a phone call that a very close friend of mine had passed away and it took the air out of me, you know, and I got to the church and I'm still trying to hold it all together because I got an assignment that it needs to be done, but it got to a breaking point and how good it felt to break and with where my where the saints of God were because in that in my breaking you know there were folks that comforted me they didn't know what was going on but they could see that I was disturbed about something you know and they prayed for me and they prayed over me and they gave me hugs and that helped and you know sometimes we don't say it enough but we don't say thank you enough to those who have been a blessing to us and sometimes you know it is just that smile that hug, that, hey, sis, I'm thinking about you. Hey, bro, you know, you're doing good. You know, that is needed to help you to keep going on. I digress for a moment. Thank you, Lord. Um, Paul, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's see, where? So Paul is, is, is telling us, this is the type of behavior that we ought to be walking in. And we and and how do we do this? We do it by being in the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and in one mind. We're in sync with one another. When we're when we're walking in the spirit, when we're when we're walking in the gifts and the anointing and in the attributes that um, the Holy Spirit has given us. We become like that married couple that finishes each other's sentences. We, we, you know, have you ever seen the couple where, you know, they go to say something and, and, and the other one finishes it or, or, you know, have you ever, um, gone to the store and picked up something that maybe somebody else was, was thinking about getting or had done a task and come, someone else had done a task for you and, it was something that you were getting ready to do and it's already done. It was that kind of in syncness, that oneness that happens, that is done out from, just because I love the Lord and I love you. That's the cross. I love the Lord and I love you. Therefore, I will do this. I don't feel it's a sacrifice to give of myself. And so Paul, he makes this appeal. Paul then gives the church of Philippi some correctional instruction. Paul goes on to say, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, regard others as better than yourself. And so here it is. We're, we're now talking about this Christian conduct. How do we get to that oneness? How do we you know, look look at ourselves in the mirror. We're, we're talking about the attitude and the behavior and the, and the characteristics that Christians ought to have, that, that, that characteristics, as well as those characteristics that we ought not to have, right? 
And so the first one that uh, Paul mentions here is that we should not have selfish ambitions or conceit. What does that mean? That means that our motive or our motivation to elevate ourselves or it should not be put in front of someone else's interest. You know, we have to put others first to think about their interests first. Really, that, that's what a marriage is about, thinking about the other more than you think about yourself. And in Heather's story, we, we don't hear that in that church meeting, do we? We don't hear them thinking about others. You know, they weren't concerned about, you know, the, 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 the people that went beyond the, the four walls in which they had um, gathered in. They weren't concerned about the ones who might want to come to the church or, you know, um, that needed to be saved. They weren't concerned about evangelizing the neighborhood, um, but they were, they were only concerned with comforting themselves. Questions, comments? One of my questions, well, actually, I was typing it in the chat, but... Um, <laughs> uh, you no, know, I was saying as you were speaking is, um, what what do you think caused the people to be like that? What was the reason? That, that's my question. What was the reason for them being like that? Yeah, and that's a good question. And like it, um, what it had mentioned in the book, you know, Heather didn't realize that her attitude had changed until time had passed by because it was gradual. It wasn't one one thing, and and the worst case scenario is at the end of the story that they mention in in there. You know, her and her husband had ended up unfortunately getting a divorce, and um, she had left the church. But it had been years since she even knocked on the door of another church because of the experience. I, 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 um, I guess, I guess I'm a. Uh... Okay, so the, the thing that causes this uh, gradual breakdown, you know, with Edda and her uh, husband, it is uh, getting away from the base, the, the base, which is uh, being closer to God prior, um, you know, prior your devotional life, if your your communication with God, prior fasting, studying the word, those are three pillars of uh, that that our whole relationship with Christ and with each other stands on. And anytime we begin to, you know, um be rash, be 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 impatient, be be you know uh, 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 selfish or prideful. We have to draw back and say, "Holy Spirit, help me." What what you know? What's happening here? We have to get back you know uh, to the, the the place of uh, of of prior of, of seeking that. So so the problem there, I think, is if you uh, if you check Edna's uh, devotional and her husband, if you check their devotional life, it was non-existent. Because the closer you are to God, the more is going to reveal that, okay, you need to put this off. You, you have this attitude. You need to deal with it. You know what I'm saying? But, but the, the further you are, because you're in church every day and you are preaching every day or you're taking um, offering every day, you know, you, you say, oh, I don't, have to, I don't have to spend time with God and get closer because I'm close enough. I mean, I'm in, I'm in this house every day. And, and that is where many of us go wrong as believers. Mm. That's can can I can I can I say something? And and if, if I if if I were dear to try to answer uh brother Le Leon's uh question, what he is from my understanding, he his question was what caused them to be like that? And if I and I just I didn't read the book, but I would say tradition. I would say that the church put God in a box and God has to, this is the box and we operate with this side of this box. 
And so when it came to the point of being able to, you know, uh, change the time of worship. So what's the difference between 1030 and 11 o'clock? You know, but because of tradition, we always done it this way. And so now the, the chain, you know, I think I, I think I think I remember one time Reverend Hobbs said, gave me a book. I think it was called the Who Moved the Pulpit, My Pulpit or something, something that's that because it was about change. And we are so because because we are so formed to keeping God in the box. And this is what we do. This is how we come into the church. And at this time we do this, this time we do that. We do. And then when the Holy Spirit comes in, we don't know what to do because it's a change from from what we normally do. So I, I think that tradition and 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 not being open to it, to it allow the, the spirit, the Holy Spirit to move us. I think that's why if I were there to try to answer his question, that's what caused them to be like that. I agree with you, uh, <laughs> Kelly. Uh, definitely not allowing the Holy Spirit to to have His way in our lives, and just being used to this. This is way. This is the way we have always done it. You know. Um. So, hey, what's this change you're coming with? So, you're absolutely right. I agree with that. And we do. We do get stuck. We get stuck in 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 routines and forms and things like that. And sometimes we don't realize it. You know, um, but sometimes we do need to be pulled on the table on it to say, hey, you know, it's okay to experience change. You know, um, seasons change. We we have to we we live in a in a world that is forever changing, you know. And so sometimes we do have to, we have to be agile. We have to be agile. But I want to get back to this text because one of the the first thing that he talked about, you know do nothing in selfish ambition but the second part that he's talking about is humility right and and humility for some reason seems to be very difficult for for people we don't usually take on in our culture a, a um an attitude of humility you know where we're able to compliment other people and recognize other people for the things that they do. However, scripture tells us that this is to the attitude that we ought to have. And we see this all the time. Jesus was, was, was a great example of showing humility. You know, just looking at some of the um, ways in which he did it, the widow with the mite, you know, very little offering that she had. He recognized it and he said that this will forever be, you know, her story will ever be um, in the scriptures. And thousands of years later, we're still reading about this widow and her might that she gave unto the Lord. He complimented Nathaniel, you know, stating that there was no deceit that was found in him. He honored um, James and John, giving them the name, the sons of thunder. He, he, he extolled, um, Peter calling him a rock, right? He recognized the woman who had anointed him with the costly oil. Um, he spoke well of John the Baptist. Um, we see that in, in Matthew chapter 11, how he said about John the Baptist that, Baptist that there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. And here, here it is, Jesus giving John all of the accolades, you know, but this was who he was. He was humble. He had humility. And so let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. How, if we keep on reading, and that's what we're going to do, because we're running out of time. Oh my goodness, time is getting away from us. Um, we keep on reading. We see how he humbled himself. Verses six through eight, it says, who, though he, speaking of Jesus, was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited but emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And so we see, you know, what he has done, that this emptying of himself, you know, Jesus was selfless, washing the servant's feet, teaching and preaching and healing and ministering to people. This is the, the, the example 
we ought to be looking at when we're thinking about, when we're comparing our humility and our um, walk with Jesus. So let's look around this, this little circle. These are different attributes that, that, that Jesus had uh, demonstrated. You know, his humility, his selflessness, he put his deity aside for us. You know, it was, it, 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 he gave himself, he was sacrificial. He gave, how, who else would do something like that? Give, give himself when he didn't have to. He could have gotten off of that course, but he chose not to. He was obedient even unto death. He was compassionate. He cared about folks, you know, um, he was a servant. He did all, all of these things. What a God we serve. You know, think about it. We Two Sundays ago was um, Palm Sunday, where we talked about, you know, Jesus, how he rode into town. He didn't come into town on, you know, a huge horse like the rest of the kings and the emperors did. No, he came in on a colt, a, a baby donkey. And so back in those days, the way that kings and emperors showed how prominent they were, you know, they rode in on these big horses because the, it represented their power and their prestige and their valor. But here, Jesus, talking about servant, talking about humility, comes in riding on a donkey. All right. So I want to, I'm going to, um, okay, no, I can't. I, I was going to skip this, but I need to read this. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of, of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. So many times we're looking for that immediate gratification, but it doesn't, it, 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 it's, it doesn't come many times. We want someone to see what we're doing when we do it. And we want them, we want them to respond right then and there. But when we walk in the attributes that were on that was on the previous slide, when we walk in that, we don't normally see initial gratification. And it's fine because guess what? We don't have to worry about that. God sees it. God sees the little worker bees that are behind the scenes, making sure things are done and um in place. He sees the faithfulness of the one that comes early in the morning to open the doors and the one that stays late at night and all the ones in between. He sees the one that's praying folks through the crisis. He sees the ones that are picking up folks and bringing them to and from church week after week. We don't have to worry about that. God sees, sees us. And if we look at first Peter chapter five, verse six, it says, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. God sees you and will exalt you in due time. Don't worry about getting gratification from people. You know, many times our head is in the sand and we don't even see. And sometimes when we do see, we forget or we're moving so fast, we forget to say thank you at times. And so don't worry about that. God will exalt you in due time. Now, this is the slide I really wanted to get to because this has us asking the right question, the wrong questions and the right questions. And so should we be asking ourselves, what am I getting out of church? Or should we be asking the question, God, how can I serve in the church? Lord, what would you have me to do? I may not be a teacher, but I can be a helper in the classroom, right? Um, I, I may not be able to sing, but I can usher. I can walk up and down the aisles and help or be a greeter at the church. Um, I, I may not have a lot of experience doing anything, but I'm willing to learn how to do it. Uh, I, I may not be able to any longer work with children because I'm, I'm getting older and I'm not as fast as I used to be to run after them, but I can, I can mentor a young person or a young mom or something like that to be able to take that, that, that place so that we can continue on and to continue to build up and grow out, right? Should we be asking ourselves, was I moved by the service? 
they didn't play my song today. I'm sorry. I wasn't moved. That person prayed too long. I, I couldn't handle it. I, I started dozing off. They was preaching too long. So I picked up my phone and started looking at Facebook and started looking in the mirror and checking out my eyes, my teeth and everything else. Started just being totally distracted by any and everything. Or should we be asking ourselves, did I give God my best praise? Did I worship the Lord with gladness? One of the things I love is when we have our special days and everything at the church, like Easter and like Christmas. And the reason why is because there's an expectation. You know, there's that preparation that goes into that day. There's excitement. There's rehearsals going on. There's prayer being lifted up. There's, you know, all of the things that are going on so that when we come together, we are anticipating a move of God in the house. We come ready. We're girded. We're ready, you know, and, 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 and because of that, the worship experience is just that because we all come with that same energy and people, and because of that, people are blessed. God takes his abode in the praises of his people. Why don't we come that kind with that kind of prepar preparation every Sunday where we can see an explosion of God every Sunday where people are being blessed, where souls are being saved, people are being healed and delivered of diseases and ailments. You know, that that's when we change our attitude from the I want to a I will. When we give it all to God, why aren't um, there are any ministries or, or programs in our church, our churches? Is that the question we should be asking? Or should we be asking the question, what am I bringing to the church? Well, yeah, that, that ministry may not exist right now, but what can I do to get that ministry moving forward? What can I do to bring forth that kind of programming so that the people of God is are blessed, so that our communities is blessed and lifted up and well-educated and informed about you know, things that are going on. Why can't we be that light, you know, that sitteth on the corner, you know, that where people are drawn to us, you know, drawn not necessarily to us, but drawn to the church, which is the Lord's house. It's not our house. It's the Lord's house, you know, and to be able to um, get their needs met. And so I know we're out of time, but I'm going to leave you with these questions to think about and some homework. Um, for you to consider. The questions are, how are some local churches like Heather acting like a religious country club? The next question, how do so many church members have a critical or negative view of the local churches? The last question, how does the right attitude of church membership or church members naturally lead to the right actions of church members or membership? I want you to think about those questions. I know we're getting ready to disconnect, but if someone wanna stay on the Zoom line to talk about this for a couple of minutes, I'll be more than happy to stay on with you. But the homework assignment for you all, is there anyone you can encourage or recognize or just say thank you to this week or say job well done. That's your assignment this week. Is there anyone you can encourage or recognize or just say thank you to or job well done? Father, thank you. Thank you for this word, Lord. And God, while we're only gathered here for just a few moments in time, I pray that those that have are listening to this uh, message, this 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 teaching, God, will go back and to study this word in Philippians chapter two. I pray, Lord, that as we study it, oh God, that we would reflect upon ourselves, oh God, and see, Lord, those areas in which we need change, God. I pray, Lord, that we have an open mind to change, oh God. Lord, that you would do a work in us, oh God. For we have not yet arrived, oh God. Thank you, Lord, but we are still a work in progress. And Lord, we trust you, oh God, 
to do that in which you desire to do. We give ourselves away unto you, O oh God. Lord, that we would be able to um, do the assignment that you desire us to do and to do it with gladness, God. So even now, Lord, encourage our hearts, God, into the pathway that you would have us to go and let us be an encouragement to others. Bless us, Lord, as we part from these lines. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.